Welcome to this podcast brought to you by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I'm your co-host, Bob Tremblay. I'm a volunteer NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, the first Vice President of Michigan's Warren Astronomical Society, and an internet factotum for the Vatican Observatory Foundation. This podcast comes from a recording of one of our monthly full moon meetups with Vatican Observatory staff and Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Sacred Space Astronomy is the Vatican Observatory's online community. We have several astronomers and scholars who write articles on our website about astronomy, space science, and faith in science. Every full moon, the Vatican Observatory Foundation hosts a Zoom meetup for our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Typically, our guest will be a member of the Vatican Observatory staff or an affiliated researcher, and they'll tell us about the research they're doing and the journey that led them to the Vatican Observatory. Brother Guy Consomagno, director of the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, will talk with our guest and our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers can ask them questions. This podcast was taken from the Full Moon Meetup on Sunday, May 15, 2022. Our guest was Dr. Maria Elana Manzani, a lead scientist for the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory and an adjunct scholar for the Vatican Observatory. I'm very happy to introduce the newest member of the Vatican Observatory, who is uh, a Vatican Observatory adjunct scholar, Maria Elena Monzani. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself? First of all, where are you from and where do you work and what do you do? So I'm from Italy, as you can probably tell from the accent and for the people on camera from how I will use my hand when talking. I grew up in the town of San Pellegrino, which is the same place as the sparkling water. It's a small town of 5,000 people in Northern Italy. So in the Central Alps, about an hour Northeast of Milan. Uh, What do I do and where I work? So I work at SLAC, National Accelerator Laboratory. At Stanford. I was getting there. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. And the Carly Institute for Particle Astrophysics and and Cosmology at Stanford University. I have to say all my institutes so they don't complain. (laughs) And um, I study dark matter. And I study dark matter with two instruments, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which is a satellite, a telescope on board the satellite, and then the Lux Zeppelin Dark Matter Detector, which is, you know, a bucket of a giant bucket of liquid xenon, which is located in a former gold mine in South Dakota. So the telescope is in South Dakota, but you're reducing the data in Stanford. In Berkeley, actually, we're using the super uh, computer at NERSC, which is an acronym of acronyms, National Energy Resource Scientific Computing, I think. Fantastic. How did you get interested in astronomy? What was your background? Do you, your parents, were they academics? Were, you know, they expecting you to go get a doctor at some place? My parents uh, hoped for me that I would work at the water factory growing up because that's a very good job with lots of good benefits. My parents were not in water, though they were in uh, electrical components. They worked at a, at a relay factory, which was the only factory in my town, which was not the water factory. <laughs> My dad is a self-taught, let's say, electrical technician. And my parents both work at the same company, so that's how they met. But they didn't go to college. In fact, neither of them graduated high school. It was, you know, a long time ago. That was not a thing where I grew up. It was still not a thing when I was going to high school. It was pretty rare to finish high school and go to college. So I got into astronomy, I think, around the age of three or four. I pieced it together. It's when the Voyager got to Jupiter and started taking photos. And basically what happened was we had two TV channels in Italy, Channel 1 and Channel 2. And Channel 2 was doing this documentary series on the outer planets. So we'll come home from uh, preschool. I was very hyper. And the one thing that made me chill was looking at this TV show and playing Lego at the same time, two things at a time. And so, you know, I remember this one about the giant spot of Jupiter, uh, this, this, this show about the uh, rings of Saturn, basically. So then I decided right then and there that I was going to study space and be a scientist. I didn't know the word physics then. I remember learning the word physics a couple of years later. And, you know, I started telling everybody that that's what I was going to do when I grew up, which everybody thought was very funny because, like, like, again, I didn't know anybody who went to university growing up. So, you know, 
they thought, well, you want to, you want to do the, the horoscope? So everybody <laughs> thought it was a joke. So that's how it started. Then there was a bit of a drama when I was 10 years old. Within three months, there was the Challenger accident and the Chernobyl accident. And when the Chernobyl accident happened, I decided I wanted to know what the atoms were. And so I had this physics book for children that somebody had bought me in the meanwhile. And you know, there was a drawing of the solar system and the drawing of the atom, which being a children book was the planetary model. And I remember looking at those two drawings and being like completely mind blown because the smallest thing I knew and the largest thing I knew had the same representation. And so that's how I got into, you know, what we call astroparticle physics, which means using astrophysical techniques to study the property of certain particles. For example, I did my thesis on solar neutrinos or using particle physics, uh, you know, particles from the universe to study the properties of the universe. So you go through high school and was it still pretty unusual at that point for students from your high school to go on to university? Maybe, maybe 20% of us started university, probably half of us or a third of us graduated. Wow. So my so the city near closest to my town is Bergamo. Bergamo didn't have a university maybe 40 years ago. When I went to college, they had they had a university with two schools, the School of Economics and the School of Law. Law is an undergrad degree in Italy, which is different from the university. That was that. So it, it was not a common thing to go to university. So how did you wind up going? I'm very stubborn. That's probably <laughs> the answer. Um, and then, you know, it was clear to my parents that they had to send me to school mm -hmm. and support me. It was just like, you know, I had to find my way. You know how that now parents, you know, go to college with their kids. They bring them, they talk to their teachers. They didn't know how to do that, right? I had to navigate student aid. I had to navigate dorms, etc. And one of my dad's closest friends has a daughter who also graduated from the University of Milan. She's about 10 years older than me. So she was finishing up when I was starting. So she's the one who took me to visit the dorms. And this is the registrar's office. This is where you sign up, et cetera, et cetera. So that was. So in Italy, do you have to pay the tuitions like they do in America or? Tuition is very low. Like the highest tuition you can, sorry, I'm saying 20, 19, 95 years price. Um, the highest tuition was uh, 6 million liras, which mm -hmm. is about 3,000 euros. That was for the School of Medicine for if you didn't have, you know, discount based on in income. Based on my parents' income, so when I started college, my dad, my dad had retired from his blue-collar job, so I qualified for all possible student aid, so I never paid tuition. They paid me a little bit to go to okay. school. There was something else that happened in your life when you were going to college. I don't know if you're willing to talk about that a bit, um, which is your faith life. Ah, yes. So um, one, so I grew up very Catholic. My family is very Catholic. My mom is a, was a catechism teacher for 60 years. I kind of got bored of the faith um, when I was in high school for reasons that, you know, all the high school children, basically, you know, it's, it was my parents' thing. And also the popular faith from, you know, Northern Italy or maybe Italy in general is very like fear-based, which was not appealing to me at all. So then uh, when I finally moved out of the house, went to college, et cetera, et cetera. So I have um, skeletal dysplasia and I have really bad hips. So I had uh, my first hip replacement in my early forties, which is quite unusual. unusual. So uh, I had several surgeries. My first year of college, three months into it, my left hip failed. And then I talked to the doctors and they told me, you know, we're going to have to wait until the summer to give you surgery, because if we do it now, you're going to lose the year of school and you're going to drop out, et cetera, et cetera. So I was in like really bad health my whole first year of college. Two things. I was in really bad health and I went to class and did not understand what my teachers were saying which had never happened to me. I did not study ever when I was in high school. I, rem I understood everything that was said to me and I remember everything that was said to me. I got to college and I had to learn how to take notes because I didn't understand everything. So I had to write it down so that I could think about it. So those two things were like um, traumatic to me because uh, 
you know, I've been dreaming of going to college and study physics my whole life. And then I get there, I'm sick, I cannot walk around, I don't understand anything. So that I was very close to like just quitting also because again, I didn't know anybody who had graduated college. So then what happened is um, in Italy, there is this ecclesial movement, which is pretty big in Italy, not so much in the US, it's called Communion and Liberation. And it was founded in Milan. And it's a big presence on the university campus of Milan. So I made friends with some of these uh, kids from, from Communion and Liberation. Like, you know, as you, like you see in the American movies, <laughs> person you meet the first day of college and you become their, your best friend for forever, basically. So that happened to me. And so, you know, these people were Catholic. I didn't have anything against the faith. I was just, you know, it was not interesting to me because of, you know, because I was a teenager, let's, let's face it. And so, you know, I became closer friends with these people. And then uh, I noticed two things that one of them, they wanted to hang out with me. They wanted to study with me, even though I did not want to study because this was hard. I wasn't used to things being hard. And so like this, this person who's my best friend to this day, both his parents had graduated in physics and he was maybe like five to 10% less smart than I was. He never thought he wasn't going to make it because his parents had graduated. So he would sit down next to me. We would study together and he didn't have the crippling self-doubt that I had. But also like he and other friends pointed out to me that, you know, Growing up wanting to be a scientist is not something that you, you find on the street. And so it was, a, it, was, it was a gift that was given to me that I had to treasure, basically. The other thing is that these friends, these Catholic friends did not think that it was lame, that I was sick, that I couldn't walk. They just wanted to hang out with me. And it was like, I don't know, it was part of their fate to accompany me when I was sick. So much so that at the end of the school year, I finally went to the hospital. I was there for about in and out of the hospital for five months. They would just go hang out at my hospital or in my parents' house. That was not something that was scandalous to them that I was sick. And I remember I had some very close friends from the dorms where I lived at the university and they were not capable of being my friends when I was sick because it was hard for them because like, why is this 19 years old? in extreme pain, why can she not walk? Why can, you know, and, and for the people, these, these people who, of faith had a different, had something else that allowed them, you know, to, to accompany me in a difficult moment. Did you ever experience, either from within yourself or from people talking to you from the outside, the question of how can you be doing physics and be a person of faith? Oh yeah, all the time. How did that usually show up? It shows up from my colleagues, like the, exactly that. And to me, is the like. But I'm, I'm thinking when you were in college, when you were at university, was that, was that something that was happening then? That people ask me or that yeah. I, well. Uh, I mean, is it mostly an American thing or was it an Italian thing? No, it's a very Italian thing, but there, there are two people, two types of people, those who think those two things are incompatible. And if you ask me, I, my answer is, how can I not? Mm -hmm. And I remember growing up and, you know, going in and out of the hospital. And even when I lost, I, when I stopped going, let me clarify, I never stopped going to church because I work, was working as a church organist in high school and college. But even when I, you know, didn't feel connected to the faith, the beauty of the universe was always obvious to me. And it was always obvious to me that there was a goodness that was the cause of that beauty. And I remember it being very connected to, you know, me being in the hospital, being sick, et cetera. I never thought that there was somebody mean making me sick because the universe was so pretty. Now, at the end of all of that, were you ever tempted to go into medical physics to actually become someone like the doctors who were working with you? I was not because I thought I paid my duties to the medical industrial complex. <laughs> I wanted to do something else, hang out in different places. Now, you know, because, um, because of my work in machine learning, I do a lot of machine learning for astronomy. Now it's interesting to me to work with the doctors on, 
imaging, finding errors in the in the imaging, etc. So, but like I wouldn't want to go in the hospital every day. What one of my great friends from MIT is uh, was doing radio astronomy, took one class in medical physics, and is now an expert at MRI imaging. It's all of the same information processing yeah. techniques. So you're at the university, you're doing physics. At that point, do you specialize in a particular kind of physics or was it just a more general physics program? So we did undergrad and master's together and we had to specialize and I wanted to do particle physics and I wanted to work at CERN actually, but my timing, so I got my master's in 2001. So that was not a good time because the uh, lab experiments had shut down and the LHC was more than 10 years away although we didn't think it was 10 years away back then. So I ended up doing an experiment on solar neutrinos that was at Gran Sasso Laboratories, so kind of close to where you've, we are. You've got to explain to these people what Gran Sasso is, because it's astonishing. So Gran Sasso is a mount, is the highest mountain in the Apennines, is maybe 80 miles east of Rome. It's due east of Rome. Yeah, it's in between the two seas, basically, the Adriatic and the, and the Tyrrhenian Sea. And basically in the early 80s, late 70s, they were building a freeway going through the mountain to connect the two sides of Italy, basically. So how long is that tunnel? About 10 miles? Then, they, yeah, then they built a tunnel, which is about uh, more like seven, 10 kilometers, okay, 11 10 kilometers. kilometers. Okay. And then can I gossip about Italian politics? Sure. Prime minister at the time was a man by the name of Giulio Andreotti, who's, who was a Catholic. And he was very good friends with, because of shared faith and shared background with Antonino Zichichi, who's a famous Italian physicist. And so Antonino told this person, you know, while you're building a big, big tunnel, can you make a side tunnel so we can make an experiment and we can send neutrinos from CERN to Gran Sasso and we can put the detector there. And basically, you know, the prime minister signed him a blank check saying, do what you want, build your tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. So they built three massive experimental halls on the side of the freeway tunnel. And that's where they have several experiments. They, you know, neutrino from CERN finally happened maybe 10 years ago. It was called the Opera Experiment. And- um, Of course, that was infamous because at one point I thought it was moving faster than light until they found the, the mistake in the wiring. Yeah. But- uh, so, and of course, being under the mountain, it's shielded from all the other, you know, cosmic rays and other things that would produce uh, confusion, just, just like your experiment in, uh, in, in South, South Dakota. Dakota. Yeah. Right. So you're doing solar neutrinos. Mm -hmm. You get, did your master's thesis. At that point, what did you decide to do? Why, why did you figure you're going to go on for a doctorate? Okay, so, fun stuff. so during my master's, I decided that I liked the work of research. But then when I was living in Gran Sasso, an Italian professor by the name of Paolo De Bernardis came to Gran Sasso to give a seminar. And that was like one of the most exciting time in recent cosmology. So basically, uh, I'm gonna step two months back or one year back. When I graduated, I was told that, you know, particle physics was almost done. We needed to measure two parameters, neutrino oscillation, see if neutrinos had a mass and then measure the density of the universe. And that was, we were very close to the end of physics. <laughs> so then they measured the famous density of the universe, which is a very important number because it tells you whether the universe is going to expand forever or it will contract again into a big crunch. And what they realized is that, oh, the universe is not gonna have a big crunch. And it was a massive, it was a spectacular result. We went from knowing the, not knowing the density of the universe within four orders of magnitude to knowing it with an error of 2%. But then, oh, and by the way, 96% of this stuff, we don't know what it is. We don't know what it's made of. We don't know what it comes, where it comes from. So that was the famous dark energy and dark matter, which is, you know, okay, there is a lot to find out about the universe. There is gonna be work for us for a few years. This is a good career to go into. So basically that happened, although I still did my doctorate on the neutrino experiment, I work on supernova neutrino. And then after I graduated, I moved on to dark matter. You know, your degree comes from two different institutions. So in Milan, but also in Paris. Yes. How does that work? So um, Europe has gone through a series of processes to unify degrees. So there is this famous Erasmus program where 
uh, undergrads can do one year or, or one semester of studies in a different universities and all the classes were recognized. But then there was this um, program which was called co tutel in French or joint thesis sponsorship where people could split their time between two different universities and get both degrees. So I like to say it was a good deal buy one get one for free so i got two doctorates the catch there was that i had to live in paris for a year and a half oh which that's is, so hard which is very hard and then and my graduation because french people still are not over the idea that all science is in english i had to write an introduction to my thesis in french and then do the defense you know a little bit in italian a little bit in french a little bit in english so that was fun my parents thought i was getting a language degree instead of a physics degree but <laughs> Well, physics is its own language anyway. So did you learn the French at that time or had you already learned it? So uh, in Italian schools, French was the language in the 70s. And when I went to middle school, it's not like you can fire the teachers. Italian public school system is the largest employer in the world and people are unfireable. So they still had teachers laying around when I went to middle school. So my I took French for for foreign language in middle school, then English in high school. Then in college, we had to take two foreign languages. So I went back and relearned French a little bit, forgot again, then I moved to Paris. And two weeks after leaving there, I was like, wait, I know this one a little bit. So that's pretty much it. All right, so you've got your degree. And mm -hmm. this is now what year? 2005. OK, and you're looking for work. I'm sure your, your parents are sort of wondering all of this education, you know, when is she going to be able to support herself? Um, where did you go? Where, where did you wind up going to work? So uh, in 2005, I went to a physics conference in uh, Taragota, Spain. And, uh, and they met this Italian woman who's a professor from Naples. She's from Naples, but she's a professor at Columbia University and she works on dark matter. She gave a talk in one of the parallel sessions about the technical measurement. And they wanted to make the same measurement on my detector with the liquid scintillator. So I talked to her, we met there, and that was that. And then a few months later, she came to Gran Sasso, talked to a friend of mine and said, oh, by the way, I'm looking for a postdoc because one of my postdocs just quit, uh, like found a position back in India. And so then basically somebody handed her my resume and she said, would you like to come work with me? And that was about that. So I did my postdoc at, my postdoc at Columbia. Then um, we so, so you lived in New York City. I lived in New York City for little less than two years. Where did you live? On campus at Columbia. Okay, which is a beautiful area. It's a beautiful area because I can't walk around very well, and New York is not a car city. Uh, it was a little bit challenging for me to live there. I enjoyed it. Year and a half was the right amount for me. Okay. There, I, another funny thing happened while you were there, which I only realized after knowing you for a while, which is the way you pronounce your name. Ah, yes. I pronounce my name. If I meet an American person, I would say Maria Elena, which is the Spanish version of it. Everybody thought I was Puerto Rican when I lived in New York because of the accent and I had darker hair than I have now. And so that's how I say my name, because in Italian is Maria Elena, which is three conjoined vowels that don't don't merge together. So it's hard for, to say for everybody. Not even my parents say the whole thing and they chose it for me. So. <laughs> Fabulous. So you're there two and a half, about two years in mm -hmm. Colombia. And then what happened? And then I made friends in California. So I went to visit a couple of times. And then, you know, there is this website, which is called, it's called now Inspire. So history of the website. The second website in the world was called Aspires. It was a preprint database, which was supported by Slack, which is the place where I work now. So that, that website has jobs in physics. So, you know, I was a postdoc, you always look at jobs. I had done a few faculty application the year before, my, on my, basically on my first year of postdoc. I had two faculty interviews, it was going well. And so one day I looked at the website and it was the middle of the summer and there was a job advertised at Slack, which was in California. And I said, oh, if I apply for this job, they will fly me out for an interview. I can go there and see my friends. And basically got stuck there, long story short. But <laughs> that was a position on the Fermi gamma ray telescope on the data management, data processing of that. So that's what I ended up doing for, let's say, full time 2007 from to 2012. 
And then I still work now on, on supporting the data management of the experiment. And you've got a very impressive title. For the, oh, it's Slack? It's Slack, It's yes. called Lead Scientist. Right. They, they redid job titles a few years ago. They, in, 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 what's the word, inserted a new, so basically grades for staff scientists go from two to six, but they were missing grade four, which is in between staff scientists and senior scientists. And so they had to find a new name, which they called it lead scientist, which is way more impressive than senior scientist, but it's not quite the same level academically, basically. And you're sure it's not lead scientists, that you're basically dealing with the, the element lead on all the shielding around experiments. That would be fun. <laughs> be interested to know more about how machine learning is being used in the field of astronomy, and it's actually very timely because one of the things that the bits of news that we have coming out of the observatory, we have chosen the topic of our 2023 summer school. And it's basically big data in astrophysics. It's all about machine learning. So tell us a little bit how machine learning is used in astrophysics. So it's used in a lot of places. I'm going to make, make a, maybe give a couple of examples from my work in the Fermi telescope. The Fermi telescope it is not a telescope, it's a particle detector, something you will put at CERN on an accelerator beam. It's a gamma ray tracker. So we put it in the sky and then we have thousands of signals for every particle that comes in. So to put together, to put back together the track and figure out you know, where the, the, the light was coming from or the, or the photons were coming from, it takes a lot of computing power. And we do that using machine learning because it's too complex a problem to solve analytically. And then one fun thing that I did with the, the data from the Fermi telescope, I did it with my colleague, Nicola Omodei at Stanford. Um, so basically the first uh, catalog of gamma ray sources that we published had about 3000 sources and maybe a third of them were new. They had never been observed before. So gamma ray, we have a really bad resolution. We don't see this, the shape of the object, so we cannot know what it is. And so basically we trained a classification tree, which is a very basic style of machine learning on the objects that had been observed by our telescope and other telescopes to make a ranking or, or attribute a probability to the new sources. So then if you say the algorithm thinks this is a pulsar, you're gonna go after it with a radio telescope. If the algorithm says this is a blazer or a quasar, you're gonna go after it with for example, a gamma ray telescope pointed in a different way. So that's one machine learning project I did. Explain in words that your mom would understand. Yes. What is machine learning? What is machine learning? Um, it's a very, 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 very extraordinarily simplified model of the brain in which you gave, so I'm gonna say one example, but basically you give a set of input to a, computer program, and then you, you know the answer. So you have basically a pattern of neuron. The, I'm explaining what a neural net is. You have this model of a neuron, which has, suppose um, I'm gonna ask the question, the answer can be yes or no. And I know what the answer is. I'm gonna ask the question a thousand times, and if, I, and if you click the, the algorithm gets it, gets it right, the right branch of the algorithm strengthens itself. And whenever it gets the wrong answer, it weakens itself. This is you know, pretty much how the neurons in our brain work. So you can make a whole network of them. And so you can strengthen the paths of, of what you think is the right answer. It's sort of a, a branching or a development of what we used to call Monte Carlo modeling, where you, you try lots of uh, possible put together and you see which ones tend to give you the most likely are most likely to give you the right answer. Yeah, you 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 basically build build paths. Now the problem is you don't want to build the path the path in a way that's too constrained, because then constrained because then you give a new problem and the algorithm will not know what to do with it. Meanwhile, you're also keeping up your faith work and you've become active in the archdiocese. Yeah, so last year during the lockdowns, maybe I can say this politely, but. The Archdiocese of San Francisco has some extremely conservative Catholics, uh, you know, in the area, which is not, not um, unusual, you know, when you have a very liberal environment, some of the Catholics overreact and become extremely conservative. So 
that was before vaccines came out, but they were doing, you know, anti-mask protests. They were protest protesting about, you know, freedom of religion during, you know, the initial lockdown. So I said, I would like to have a conversation with, you know, the people from my, my, my archdiocese, but not confrontational. I want to tell them my experience of being a scientist, basically. And so with the School of uh, Pastoral Leadership, we organized a five lectures course that I taught. You know, it was during lockdown. So we had a lot of people on Zoom on Tuesday, Monday nights meeting and talking about science and faith. And my approach to science and faith is completely asystematic. So I'm not gonna explain what it is. I will tell you like what my experience is as a scientist and you know how the universe is so pretty that you know I cannot think that somebody evil made it or that it came out of random but like so basically that's a little bit my approach and uh, describe how we met how did we meet so uh, a very good friend of mine who I met uh, who I knew from physics told me about six years ago that he was going to join the Jesuits so that was the end of it then I heard uh, that this person Guy Consolmagno, director of the Vatican Observatory, who's a Jesuit, was going to teach a retreat uh, in Los Altos Hills, which is close to my house. There is, a, there is a Jesuit retreat center there. So I'm like, I think I should learn more about the Jesuits because my friend just joined them. And it was pretty striking to me that somebody, you know, in their 40s with an academic career would, you know, quit his academic career to join the religious life. So I went to this retreat. Um, and I think we met on the first day I was there. And, you know, the average age was, was pretty high. So I stood up, stood out in multiple ways. So we, we, I think we had dinner together and you said, right. who are you? Why are you here? What are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And then I said, you know, a friend of mine joined the Jesuits. Do you know this person by the name of Paolo Beltrame? And I go, oh my gosh, Paolo. Because of course, Paolo is about to join the Vatican Observatory as a regent in his regency and will be living with us in Tucson. And he's looking for a research project to do there. So what do we do? We actually call you up. Yes, yeah, so I've been, um, I have two colleagues who work at the University of Arizona who both did their postdoc at SLAC in the Kavli Institute. And one of them studies dark energy and one of them studies dark matter. Now, Paolo was studying dark matter before, you know, when we were working together. So I, you know, hadn't talked to those people and we we're setting up a collaboration with them, et cetera, et cetera. So. And as we got to know each other, we discovered all of these people who we had met in common. And it seemed like we kept running into people that we knew. Uh, one of them was a, a Polish fellow who took the name John Paul II. Describe how you met Pope John Paul II. I met Pope, Pope John II two weeks before his assassination attempt, which was quite striking. I was five years old. He was in Bergamo uh, for a celebration, um, some anniversary of John the Twenty Third. That's John the Twenty Third was born maybe fifteen miles from where I grew up. So there was this big celebration. I was sitting front. Uh, court, extreme left corner. So if you see photos of the of the day, and there is somebody with the you know riding red hoods, who uh, <laughs> the red red riding hood, red riding hood. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I, I was wearing that outfit. It was pouring cats and dogs. So I was wearing a red um, raincoat, maybe. And so at the end of it, the Pope came down, and I was sitting with the sick. With the, and the people there were like really sick people in the coma, et cetera, et cetera. And the Pope came down and greeted everybody one by one. And then my mom basically pulled his sleeve and he said, oh, look at us. And he picked me up, gave me a big kiss, gave me back to him. And then two weeks later, same thing happened in St. Peter's Square, picked up a little girl, gave her a big kiss, gave her back, and then immediately was shot. That was like two weeks after that. Oh, my goodness. No, yeah. I didn't know that part. Oh, I didn't oh, say yeah. that part. Yeah. Oh, my. Okay, so we're ending into the, the last five minutes or so of the conversation. Um, I have a question to basically, can you tell folks here, why are you here right now this week? So this week we're doing a little cosmology workshop to, uh, to tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So Paolo is gonna be visiting. There is somebody from Canada who's also an adjunct scholar who's visiting. 
And then, you know, there is a little core of cosmologists now at the Vatican, which was which is kind of a new thing, right. I would say. Matteo and uh, uh, Gabriele have both had uh, uh, gatherings here. But then after, but then, that, after that, that, on Thursday, I'm going to Cologne, Germany. So I'm going through the astronaut selection for the European Space Agency. So the European Space Agency is doing the first ever of any agency selection of astronauts with a physical disability. So you are a candidate to be an astronaut. Yes. What's the procedure from here? What happens if everything goes well on Thursday? Uh, then we have a medical exam, which as far as I understand is very thorough. We get probe in every possible you know, uh, body part. <laughs> Uh, that lasts about a week. It's supposed to be this summer. Then there are two rounds of interviews and then they will announce the class in the fall. There will be five astronauts and then an astronaut re reserve corp. The reserve corp is where they will appoint the person with disability or persons with disability because they cannot guarantee a, um, a mission at the time because then if I'm selected or anybody else is selected, then we have to invent a mission for you know whoever the person is based on the based on their uh, attitude and physical skills etc cetera, etc cetera. for example you know if i go to space i cannot exercise work out with the machines they have there i will have to design new ones that work for my body i, I really wanted to ask you about that if you, <laughs> if you got in they'd have to make a suit for you right do they oh, everybody gets their own suit and everybody gets their own seat <laughs> like the seat that you fly in, especially if you go on the Soyuz, they literally oh! move the seat to your uh, butt. Wow! <laughs> For lack of a better word, the the SpaceX seats are, are uh, adjustable. They're not made custom, but yeah, everything has to be, especially for like neck support, back support, it has to be. I never even thought about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So That's they really they cool. leave the the height limits are for um extravehicular activities that they have two sets of suit, medium and large. But now even for those, they're making them custom for each astronaut. So, so that's, that's a project. And also we need to um, convince all the international partners of ESA that you know, if they bring me to space, I'm not gonna be a danger for their, their, uh, their astronauts, et cetera, et cetera, their crew. On the other hand, uh, the disability that you have with your hips and your legs, probably won't be a problem in low gravity. That's correct. For example, I'm very short, but you know, the, 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 the International Space Station is about six meters across and there are drawings on all sides and it's not a problem because you just float and get things up there. So basically the criterion here is people with the disability would make them good swimmers would probably do pretty well in space. So we wish you all the best of luck. Uh, it would be delightful to have somebody in space that we knew. And uh, we thank you for your time here, your presence here, and all the work you're doing, both in the world of science and in the world of faith and science. Thanks a whole lot for being part of this gang. Thank you for having me. That's a wrap for this podcast. Our audio editors were Brother Guy Councilmanio and myself, Bob Tremblay. You can listen to our other podcasts and read our posts on the web at vaticanobservatory.org. If you'd like to attend our full moon meetups live, join our Sacred Space Astronomy community, also at vaticanobservatory.org. Clear skies, everyone.